we can uh, we can open to John chapter one. Boy, there's a lot of preaching and teaching is done from this chapter, but perhaps not these particular verses. Verse 40 and 41, we'll look at it. It says, And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew's, Simon Peter's brother. This is referring back to the verses 35 through 39, where John proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God. Amen. And two of John's disciples followed Jesus and went to where he was staying at. But it says that one of those was Andrew, Peter's brother. And going on to verse 41, it says, He first finds his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. Amen. So I'd like us to think about what does this mean when we call him Christ? Mm. Yeah. We use that term maybe loosely sometimes. It's not just his surname that some people seem to think. Right. It was a, a title and a name of the Lord Jesus. Oftentimes people use it as a interjection or a, as a cuss word. Or, right. But the title of Christ really has meaning to it more Amen. than you would thought. Yeah. We see here both Messiah and Christ in this particular verse in verse 41. Messiah, for any of those that care about word study, it comes from the Hebrew Messiah into the Greek and then transliterated to the English. It's only, it's only used here in one other place we'll look at in a moment in John chapter 4. And then Christ also is Messiah being literally translated into Greek and then transliterated and anglicized into English mm -hmm. from the Greek word Christos to Christ. But both of these mean anointed, consecrated, or Amen. chosen. It's often used as the word <clears throat> anointed in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But Christ was the anointed one, not just a anointed one. <laughs> Jesus were anointed of God, but Christ means that he is the anointed of God. Amen. We can turn over to Luke chapter 4, and Christ Luke professes this himself. And in the beginning of his ministry, he was in the temple. In Luke chapter 4, verse 17, he had asked that the scroll would be given to him, and it says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this goes to 1 Isaiah 61, verse 1, and the first part of verse 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the Brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight for blind, and set at liberty them which are bruised, to preach the acceptable year for the Lord. And going on, he goes on to say, And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister, and sat down in the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue, were passing on him, and began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. And Christ keeps he was anointed by the Lord, by the Spirit of the Lord, by the Holy Spirit descending down upon him. That is also recorded in the Gospels how that when he was baptized, it said that as a dove came down, the Spirit of the Lord came down and descended upon him. Amen. They heard a voice speaking, saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. That was a physical manifestation of the anointing of God upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But to say that he is Christ means that really all these things, that he came to preach the gospel to the poor, and that doesn't mean 
the poor monetarily, but spiritually poor. Right. Heal those that are brokenhearted, to deliver those that were captive, to sin, the recovering the sight to those that are spiritually blind. Of course, he did heal the physically blind as well. And set at liberty them that are bruised. Really to profess that he is Christ is to profess that he was the one sent of God. Amen. If we turn over to Acts chapter 10, we see here this is confirmed by the early church. Uh, Acts chapter 10 and begin in verse 38, 4 through verse 40. Remember, right, Peter here is preaching and he says in verse 38, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Here we see that he was anointed with the Holy Ghost, so it says, and the hand of power. We know that he was God in the flesh, but in another sense, he was. In his body, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. It was his power came down on him, which only could come from God. Amen. So to the Jews, to profess that he was the Christ and the Messiah was no small ordeal. When they had been looking for the Messiah for really their whole existence as a nation, the Old Testament had prophesied of him and pointed to him. So to proclaim that. Messiah was come to, was to proclaim that the Savior had come, that the one they had been looking and longing for had come. Amen. It was to proclaim that he was from God and approved of God, which the Jews by and large rejected in his day. But if you remember back at his birth in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Unto you this day is born in the city of David, the Savior, Christ the Lord. Mm -hmm. He didn't become Christ, but he always was Christ. Amen. It wasn't just some prophet which God picked out and said, yeah, he'll do. So we'll get to here in a moment. Let's go over John chapter 4. We'll see this other use of the term Messiah. And she was called Christ. This is a familiar passage, no doubt. A woman at the well here. We'll pick up in verse number 25 of John chapter 4. After they had been talking, well, she had said, said she perceived that he was a prophet. Mm -hmm. Down to verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Well, she said she knew that the Messiah was coming, that the Christ was coming. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that she was talking to him and she couldn't even see it. I do find it interesting that she uses the word Messiah because it's, the actual word Messiah is only used twice in the Old Testament. And mm -hmm. It's in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, mm -hmm. speaking of the 70 weeks of Israel. And it, other than that, Messiah, they were using the Old Testament and the Samaritans didn't have the book of Daniel. They only used the Pentateuch. Right. So whether they had borrowed this term from the Jews or I'm not sure, but she knew that Messiah was coming. Mm -hmm. Which of course we can find him throughout all the prophets and including the Pentateuch. Genesis 3.15 is one of the very first ones with when he tells the serpent that the seed of the woman shall he shall bruise his heel, but he shall bruise the seed shall bruise his head. Mm -hmm. We see again in Deuteronomy 18, Moses says there will be a prophet raised up like unto him. And you shall hear him. That's referring to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, in Genesis 49, it tells us that, I forget how exactly it goes, let's turn over there. But speaking of Judah, mm-hmm. and how the Christ will come out of Judah, Genesis 49, and this is when Jacob is blessing his sons here. In verse 10 it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until a child is come. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people be. Amen. That Shiloh was referring the reference to the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Really, he, he will be the great lawgiver and judge. And all the people of Judah will be gathered unto him. Amen. As we can see, even in the, the Pentateuch of the prophesying of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Yeah. This woman understood that he was coming, but she didn't understand who he was. Verse 26, then Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Amen. He reveals himself to her, and then in verse 28, she goes back to tell others. The woman then left her water pot and went her way in the city, into the city, and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things ever that I did. Is not this the Christ? Amen. Again, she is professing that the one who fulfilled all the prophecies that came. To profess that Jesus is the Christ, and do exactly that to say that he is the Savior, that he has come, and he fulfilled all those prophecies which were prophesied of him. Well, at this point, they, I guess they still had to believe that some of them will be fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we look back and see that they all were fulfilled in him. Amen. That he wasn't just this prophet that he thought he was at the beginning. That he wasn't just a good person, but he was the very Savior. That is what it means to profess that he is the Christ. So we... Why... Well, I often use that term Christ. Paul often uses it in his writings as well to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ just as Christ. Mm -hmm. But it's not just some empty term that we apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We we can turn over to Matthew chapter 16. Brother Larry just read this the other day. Matthew does not record the particular instance where we read in our text in John, but we do know what happened somewhere after the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ because back in that same text, John says that he saw the Spirit descending like a devil upon him. Amen. So sometime after Christ's baptism is when our, our text occurred. But here we are, some 12 to 13 chapters later, and we see Peter professing who Jesus really is. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read verses 13 through 16. It says, When Jesus came in the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am, or that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, that's all that man could ever think that he was, a some prophet or a good man. Mm-hmm. Verse 15 goes on, He saith unto them, Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Thou art the chosen one, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who was coming and now here, and he would fulfill all the scriptures regarding him, but from Psalms 22 to Isaiah 53 to Genesis 3, all of those passages will be fulfilled in him. That's profess that he is the Christ, we must profess that he has done all those things. Mm-hmm. And for a few at that time to say such a thing was a pretty big ordeal, wasn't it? Amen. 
from here, and he connects him with being the Christ, the Son of the Living God. You know, he wasn't just a created being like you and I, but he was the very Son of God. Amen. Those two things cannot be separated. Amen. You know, there's a song that I hear sometimes, and overall the song is good, but one part of the song says they searched through heaven and found a Savior. They didn't, mm -hmm. God didn't look around through heaven and figure right. out someone suitable. But God in eternity past determined Amen. that he, in the form of God's Son, would die for his people. That's it. Notice what it says in verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. This flesh cannot understand that. It must be revealed to us by God. Just like the Samaritan woman at the well, she, she was talking to the very Christ that she was looking for and didn't even know who it was. Right. Until he revealed himself to her. When he said he came to give sight to the blind, I mean, yes, he did that physically, but he also had to do that spiritually to all of us. Amen. But we were blinded by sin and by the fall. We could not see spiritually. And yet Christ restored that sight to us. We turn over to John chapter 11, we'll see Martha professes the same thing that. Peter does here. And when Jesus had come down to raise Lazarus from the dead, and she went out to greet him. When he finally got there, John chapter 11, read verses 25 through 27. Cool. In verse 24, well, it says, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection, the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. And whosoever believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Most her answer. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Amen. She professes here that he is the Christ, the Son of God. If he asked her, do you believe that whoever believes in him shall live and not die? And she must have thought, she obviously wasn't thinking physically that Lazarus, her brother, was already dead. Mm -hmm. No, but spiritually, we have life in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he says here, he is the resurrection and the life. He was described in the Revelation as he which was, was alive and was dead and is alive forevermore. Mm -hmm. but to profess that he is the Christ means that we have to profess that he is really the giver of all spiritual life. Mm -hmm. yeah. As he says, that he, believe, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and who is believeth in me. In him, in me shall never die. Well, in Christ, we will never die spiritually. Amen. In order to say that He is the Christ, profess that that we, and in Him, is the power of life and death, both physically and spiritually. Amen. <coughs> and also to say that He is the Son of God. Amen. Sent of God, chosen of God, and approved of God. We profess that Jesus is the Christ. Profess that He is the Son of God, sent to give life to God's people and deliver them from their sins. If we really profess anything less than that of Him. We're not giving Him all the glory that we should. Yeah. Back to the Book of First John. I didn't write down notes that it says that. All that's profess that he is the Son of God. God dwells in him and he in God. But if we don't profess that he is the Son of God, then we're not of God. Amen. And he's not just 
a son of God like you and I are, but he is the son of God, the really God, the son as well. Amen. Jehovah's Witnesses like to take that part out, but... Right. Yeah, he cannot be one without the other. Right. And just that he is the Christ embodies all of that. I know the Jews, by the time Christ came, were primarily looking for a physical kingdom to come and restore the kingdom of Israel. He will do that in his time, but that really was not his purpose in his first coming. The scriptures they bear that over and over again, that that was not just why he came. Mm -hmm. I assume Thinking from a fleshly standpoint, they must have, I'm sure that's what they longed for, was it, to be free from the Roman rule and to right. be an independent country again. Yeah, what they needed more than that was a savior, one that could deliver them their sins. And when he came, they weren't expecting him. And by and large, many of them didn't, would not see him as the Christ. We might see him as the Messiah. They're still looking for their Messiah today. Mm -hmm. I know some of them will believe in time, but by and large, the majority of them have been blinded. You're right. So for, for us to have the Christ, the Messiah, is a blessed privilege as the Gentiles. So he came primarily to his own first, didn't he? Amen. Was back there in John chapter one, it says that he came to his own, his own received him not. Mm. Well, the fact that we can call him the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen of God, is a blessed privilege. I think sometimes we don't think very much. Amen. About. You're right. When going to according to Acts chapter sixteen, they told the flipping jailer to. Believe that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. That he is all three of those. Mm -hmm. so we could break that down, but he cannot be one without the other. He cannot be Lord without Jesus or the Savior, and he cannot be the Savior without being the Christ. So when we call him Christ or the Christ or the Messiah, really we are professing that he is the fulfillment of all those prophecies that he is the very savior that would come and that is had say that he is the Christ for us as the Gentile people is even more a privilege because we were not looking for him we were not, Amen. We were not given the prophecies that he would come but that he would turn and be gracious and merciful to us and that we would call him the Christ is a blessed privilege Amen no. Do you know this Messiah, which is called Christ, as Andrew professed? Mm -hmm. you know, so many today know of Jesus as a, a prophet or a good person or someone who had good teachings or sound advice, but you, know, you must believe that he is the Messiah, which is called Christ. Amen. Amen. The flesh and blood cannot reveal it unto you, as he told Peter. Well, thanks be to God, he has revealed it unto you. Mm -hmm. That he is the very Christ that should come. That he is the Savior, which was prophesied of. And that he didn't just fulfill some of those prophecies, but fulfilled all of them. Amen. For what it's worth, I've read that it's at least statistically impossible that any one person could fulfill just three, I think, of those prophecies. Yet yeah, Christ fulfilled all of them. Amen. To profess that he is the Christ doesn't go along with human logic and reasoning, but it takes that faith which only comes from God. So do you know him as Christ? Do you know him as Savior? We're going to close with that up for a bit. Amen.